fabulous thank you so much for seeing um for, for coming along today and spending your lunch hour with us so this is the um it's the last it's actually part five of our summer series and we're really really delighted to have dr krishna kasarini with us this afternoon um and krishna is the um GPC executive or on the GPC executive and I'm going to ask him a little bit more about what that means as we move through the session so um, I don't think I need to um, introduce ourselves again just that we're missing Robin today because she's in the sun somewhere and I imagine sipping oh, a sangria a yeah. yes I think she's probably having a sangria somewhere so oh, fantastic so here we are, Krishna. So you're a GP, you're a working GP, and you're also mm -hmm. on the executive team. Sure. Is that right? Um, yes, yes, that's right. So from uh, three days a week, um, no different to any other jobbing GP. I'm a partner in a surgery, 13,000 patients, uh, multi-site practice, ordinary GMS practice, nothing special, nothing extra, just run-of-the-mill general practice, really. And for the remaining two days, I'm part of the, we're a team of four, who uh, essentially with a negotiating team for GPC. So we'll look through um, all the aspects of the contractual matters as well as all the non-contractual non and professional issues to do with general practice. Brilliant. And it's great that you're saying uh, for all of general practice, because some of our, our questions are about practice management as well. So I'm, I'm really delighted. That'd be great. Yeah. So I'm going to, we've got, we, I know we've only got half an hour and we've um, got tons of questions. So sure. what's it like at the moment for you as a, a jobbing GP in general practice? Um, oh God, you're going to start with a really negative one, aren't you? Um, it, it's like most people. I think it's been in incredibly difficult. Um, COVID certainly has impacted people differently, both on a personal and professional level. And going to work nowadays feels a, a lot more difficult. It's the, I think the expectations on general practice, the attacks recently on general practice haven't really helped the morale of the profession at all. And we really haven't been given the time, space, or the resources to be able to do our job properly. Uh, uh, and I mean that for all of us in general practice, all of our teams. And it's been uh, incredibly challenging and difficult. And I suspect I'm, I'm feeling like what most of our colleagues are, are feeling at the moment. Yeah. Um, and, and you've done some work with, with us and other partners right into the Secretary of State as well about, mm -hmm. about that. It mm -hmm. just feels in stark contrast to um, 12 months ago with the, you know, the rounds of applause and all that kind of stuff yes, feels yes. so very different. Indeed, indeed. So thinking about us as practice managers or business managers mm -hmm. or whatever our, our job may be, um, mm -hmm. what do you think a good practice manager brings to general practice? Oh, a, a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, I rely uh, on my practice manager to be able to do everything so that I can focus on the clinical aspects. So it's plain and simple. So be able to run the show, the recruitment aspects of things, looking at the different services, accounts, HR, every single thing. And we expect practice managers to be able to be absolutely excellent at all of those things. And, and most of you, if not all of you, are at that level where you allow us clinicians to get on with seeing the patients, where all the background work has been done by you. And, and that's been... Uh, really been put to the forefront in the last few months when suddenly general practice had to, uh, to rise to the challenge of delivering the COVID vaccination program. And yes, once it may be the clinicians that are sticking the needle in, uh, all the background work to allow that to happen has been done by you. So in fact, what I think a good practice manager brings a lot and everything essentially, and the ability for us to actually get on seeing patients. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we of course would agree with that. And certainly, um, the thought of now going into the winter with the with the, the kind of COVID booster campaign, which we yeah. all want to do, we re, you know yeah. it's it's our hearts to do the, the right thing. Yeah, it's um, the prospect of doing that again is is quite yeah. overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any ideas on what you think the future of practice management looks like? Uh, I think it has changed significantly. I mean, I, I would certainly look at general practice management firstly as, as not a very homogenous group at all. So general practice managers come from very different backgrounds and I've had the pleasure of working with many and, and now interacting with you on, on here in recent times too. Um, and I think irrespective of the background, whether it's somebody who's worked through the ranks at a practice uh, and actually learned on the job or whether it's somebody who's gone through professional qualifications or someone who moved from another sector into general practice management, 
I think irrespective of that background, it's becoming more and more challenging. It's becoming more and more specialized. Uh, and which is one of the reasons I think when, when we need to look at how practice management works, even compared to 15, 20 years ago, the aspects of things that were traditionally run by practice managers and you look at things now and you think it's completely changed. So there's more, I suspect, about collaboration of practice managers and not just locally at a practice level or PCN level, but also at the kind of level that you guys are trying to do with the Institute of General Practice Management is to be able to support practice managers at that level. And we certainly want to be there to, to walk that journey with you um, and to support one another. Because I think whatever happens at the practice level also needs to be replicated at the national level. And we're very keen to continue to do that. That, that's that's brilliant and um we feel we we kind of feel like we're here now and and um we are the institute we are the representative body and that um is a huge achievement for 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 us as a profession so so mm -hmm. thank you for for working with us moving forward and and we think as the igpm there's great stuff that we can do um to work with you and and vice versa so we we you know so many acronyms so many different organizations how does that relationship work between the gpc and the bma sure so the, the bma is a british medical association we've been around since 1832 uh, and gpc is the general practitioners committee of the bma so it, it's not really two different things as such uh, but the gpc has been in one form or the other been in existence since 1911 1912 um, so that's a good 110 year history of, of that and essentially what we do as uh, my role within the GPC as the England executive team is to represent GPs interests um, and negotiate on behalf of GPs. I also sit on BMA Council where we look at issues that are more pertinent to the wider profession as the BMA represents about 158,000 doctors uh, and medical students. So everybody in the UK basically. Um, so we are the professional trade union um, organization for all of the medical, uh, medical workforce in the UK. Okay, and then LMCs. Sorry, this this is a, a kind of sub question. Yeah. Are they part of the GPC or the BMA or something different? No, LMCs are completely autonomous. Again, most of us who have a role in GPC have one have some form of involvement with the LMCs. So the LMCs are the local representatives for general practitioners. Um, the big distinction is that the LMC is not a trade union. So I think it's it's one thing that needs to be clear. It's only the BMA that's a trade union. But essentially, what the LMC does at a local level is what the GPC does at a national level, working as part of the BMA um, for, for general practitioners. And the BMA as a whole also looks after the interests of the wider profession and medical students as well. So some LMCs have practice manager reps mm -hmm. on them, mm -hmm. don't they? Yes, so that's, yes. That, that's kind of allowed at that level. Okay, brilliant. Yep. Thank mm -hmm. you. And um, you just mentioned the BMA is is UK wide. How does it work in the in the other um, other areas? So we've got members in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. We, we've had a GPC, in fact, GPC UK still exists. So General Practice Committee of the UK. And certainly, when I joined earlier on, uh, most of business used to happen at that level. But I think what's been acknowledged over the last decade or so is that health is now so much more devolved in the four nations so it then resulted in the individual nation gpcs so gpc england wales scotland northern ireland so uk deals with mainly non-contractual matters or professional issues that affect all of the profession but the individual contractual issues are dealt with by the uh, the nation's executives and and i deal with uh, england but we also liaise with one another i regularly uh, liaise with Northern Ireland. So between the four of us, three of us have another country that we liaise with. Uh, so my responsibility is with Northern Ireland and work really closely with them and, and know the issues um, that, that are affecting our colleagues in Northern Ireland. And my colleagues Mark and Farah liaise with Scotland and Wales. And okay. Richard Vautry is chair of GPC UK, deals with both UK issues and England issues. Okay, brilliant. That's great. Thank you. Um, so us as the IGPM and our members, mm -hmm. what could we do differently or what could we do better to support you and the BMA? Oh, I, I really hope you don't do anything differently because at the moment we have a really good relationship with you. We're working together on many areas. The work you did on uh, bullying of GP staff um, a few months ago and, and the recent work that we've done together, including writing to the Secretary of State about support for general practice. I think we have a really good relationship. It's, it's been a, a very constructive way of working with you and, and we hope to build on that. So please don't change it. it it's working oh, well thank you and you know you've just used a word that um that I hadn't thought of you've used bullying 
and mm -hmm. I, I I kind of see always think of it as abuse but actually mm -hmm. you're you're right it is bullying mm -hmm. isn't it mm -hmm. yeah so, indeed indeed there's yeah. there's not much difference between the two no no okay um and um is there anything different that the GPC can do to to help practice managers is there anything in your your plans that's specifically about that non-clinical part of the profession uh, of, of the uh, workforce sure i think one thing is, is to be able to work with you much more closely i think uh when we started off these discussions uh, it'd be fair to say none of us knew one another so so we built those relationships over time and where we're both comfortable with working with one another and sharing issues and looking at aspects of contractual matters too that you need a heads up on and we need your views on um, in the way that we've done with the, the PCSC survey as well. Yeah. Uh, again, we wouldn't have been able to get that reach without your support. And we'll continue to do that. And please do feed back to us about areas that you feel that we can work together on. There, there's sometimes there will be a little bit of reluctance simply because of the fact that the BMA is a trade union and we have to comply with certain trade union legislations that may okay. mean there's areas of work that we can't work with others on, but where we can, and we find ways of making sure that we can uh, work with others and particularly with Institute to make sure that we can represent the voice of general practice strongly at a national level. Thank you. And um, you just mentioned the PCSE survey. I know Nicola's put a link in the chat. So if you haven't done that, it, we would really appreciate it if you could um, complete that survey. It's really quick and it will just give us that snapshot of, um, of the current issues with PCSE and whether things have improved um, in the last kind of two, three months. OK, um, do you know if, um, if, if you've kind of encouraged GPs to to get their their practice managers to join the IGPM we've certainly communicated to members I think pretty early on when you uh, launched the website and the structures of the organization I think we've met you before all of that process started uh, and all of the joint communications that we do we share with our members every week and for the benefit of the man uh, other managers that are joining all the comms that we send out to GPs and LMCs are now shared with the Institute so that you can pass them yeah. on uh, to, to practice management too. Um, and I think that's great because I mean, certainly before my GPC role, uh, I was an LMC medical director. And I remember that being of most of the queries that we used to get in the interactions uh, went with GPs. It was actually with practice managers because you are the agents of the GPs working on their behalf and all the issues and the interactions with them. Uh, and all four of us on GP England Executive have been or are currently are LMC officers too. So we know that interaction at a local level. Uh, and what we try and do is to make sure that any of our work, we're not just thinking about GP doing something, we're thinking about GP practices doing something. And in most of those scenarios, it's the practice managers who will be doing it. That's why if you'll remember the, the two PCSE surveys, the first PCSE survey when we put out, some colleagues have come back to say, well, why aren't the practice issues here? Well, because the practice issues won't be filled in by the GPs, it'll be filled in by the practice managers. Yeah. And we wanted to do a much more extensive survey on that one. And the pensions one earlier on is really about individuals uh, more than the collective uh, yeah. as such. Yeah, I don't think my partners would know anything about PCSE from, no, you know, no. dates. And, and rightly so as well, rightly so. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so another question from one of our members, uh, mm -hmm. great to see so much action, our joint letters, surveys, collaboration. So how do things get followed up? How do you have regular meetings with the people, with those, those people? Are you speaking about the results? How do we, how do we move on? Sure. So it depends on the topic. So what we tend to do, uh, I mean, again, there's been a slight change this year in that we withdrew from negotiations with NHS England, uh, but we've now returned to that uh, as of two weeks ago. And what tends to happen is depending on the issue, some will be dealt with in contract negotiations. So for that, the negotiations have to happen between the trade union that represents GPs and the state. So in this case, it will be NHS England as the one who has devolved responsibility for that. But depends on the issue. So for example, a couple of days ago, I think Mr. Javid mentioned in parliament that he's working with the BMA and addressing some of these issues. Well, he's not met us yet. So okay. when there's statements like that, that's made that was working with, with the BMA and we will call, call him out on that. Uh, so he hasn't met the BMA. He hasn't met us to discuss the issues for general practice to okay. be able to address them. So some will be dealt with contractually. Some will be about campaigning uh, and lobbying members of parliament as well as others to try and force change 
and um, naturally uh, the annual contract negotiations happen every year too so there's always that furore of stuff and information that comes through leading up to April. Okay so we we wrote to him in that joint letter didn't we was that last week would you expect that he will respond formally? I, I hope so no because that, that's the reason why all of us got together and, and yeah. written it uh, along with college and confed and okay. it's important the government are held to account for the decisions they make or in this case the decisions they're not making uh, okay. which is about supporting general practice. Great thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> This is a, 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 a tough, tough question, I think, um, mm -hmm. and one that lots of practice managers are asking us about all the time and mm -hmm. asking us as the IGPM, you know, uh, we've had requests whether we'll take their case to court because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's discrimination. We've had mm -hmm. had lots of um, lots of very upset practice managers that they've not been allowed to join the new to partnership scheme. Mm -hmm. Can you give us any update on this? Uh, not at the moment, apart from to say, firstly, we are keen for practice managers to join practices uh, as partners. Uh, again, it's not a everybody should or everybody shouldn't. If it's right for you and you want to, you should be able to. And the purpose of the new partnership payment scheme is to encourage partnerships and to support ones who are particularly new to those roles to be able to access that training uh, fund to be able to develop themselves. And we're desperately keen to do that. And from a, a BMA perspective, the only reason why practice managers weren't introduced at the same time as GPs and clinicians were what will access it only. There's two, two aspects. One we fixed and the other one we hope to work with you to be fixing that. Uh, one was about final pay controls and how the pension scheme actually works against non-clinicians if you were to join as a partner in some situations. So we uh, circumvented that and we, we found a solution to it. The other one is about being able to have a, a register of, of sorts to be able to recognize an individual as a practice manager role. Uh, we're very keen for that to happen. Um, we want to make sure we work with you to let that happen. And I hope colleagues will be able to take on partnership roles uh, in general practice as practice managers. Uh, I think that should be done. And we'll do everything we can uh, in our capacity to, to lobby for that and facilitate change. But if there are any problems, we'll come back to you. Absolutely. OK, so just that that bit about the, the registration and mm -hmm. we 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 understood that. So, you know, one of the reasons why we, we were encouraged to set up the IGPM mm -hmm. um, physician associates. Mm -hmm. They are not a registered registered um, group, but they were allowed to join. How, how does uh, that? They have a voluntary register at the moment. So at the moment, their register isn't recognized in statute and that's likely to change in the next few months um, because GMC is going to be registering them. And at the moment, they actually have a voluntary register that's run by the uh, Faculty of Physician Associates as part of the Royal College of Physicians. So that's the reason why that was slightly different. Okay, so our, our voluntary register, when we get our accreditation process set up, which will be <laughs> October, once we've done that, that's when we can work together to really force NHS England to, to, to keep their promise to, to add those that want to, to join the yep. um, new to partnership scheme. Absolutely. Okay. And, and there are lots of practice managers amongst our members that are already partners. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I know some of the questions are around, will it be backdated? Uh, I guess we can't say that until the negotiations start. Uh, yes, I mean, it, as a general principle, and, and I'll be honest with you, it, it, it tends not to be backdated stuff. And so contractual requirements can only come into place once the contract is in. Uh, and you'll understand why. So that the last thing we need is any kind of contract. Imagine if somebody says, by the way, you quaff for the last five years is now changing retrospectively. That, uh, that just won't work, I'm afraid. So the general principle, it, it, it is always when it comes into place going forward. But we can certainly have discussions about the way it's structured uh, and how it works uh, for practice management. But the first thing is to be able to get back in discussions with NHS England on this so, so that we can jointly push on the issue to make this happen. Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks for your honesty around that as well. Mm -hmm. So they were all the questions that we had prior to the session. But I'm conscious that Nicola and Joe have just been watching the chat as well. Um, and sure. this is this is me to remind everybody to go to that PCSE um, poll that that survey that Nicola's put into the the chat. Nicola, I know you've got uh, um, lost your voice a little bit, so I don't know whether you can croak any questions at us. 
Yeah, I, I can definitely croak a question. So um, one is around existing managing partners, Krishna, and it says, um, you know, if the B BMA is there to negotiate on behalf of GPs, are they not there to negotiate on behalf of the manager partners as well? And if they are, why aren't manager partners allowed to become members of the BMA? Okay, so that's more so about the trade union function of it. BMA is the only recognized trade union for doctors. So, and technically even for medical students, uh, it's not a trade union function as such because medical students are employed as such. So that's dictated by trade union legislation, I'm afraid. So we are only recognized to be a trade union for doctors and doctors only. Uh, that's why we negotiate only on behalf of um, well, it's GPs, consultants, junior doctors, SAS doctors, and everybody. But GPC does with GPs only. We, we're not legislation wise, we're not allowed to be negotiating on behalf of anybody else. Are there managing partners anywhere in your organization then, Krishna? Are there, are there, is there a presence of non clinical partners? In my own practice, you mean? No, or? no, no. I was just thinking oh. about: is there a committee or anything that deals with them as a subgroup? Of, there's, uh, there's ones for medical managers, um, oh, okay. which, uh, so which is slightly different, obviously. So they're doctors, uh, are they? They're, they're, the, yeah, yeah. So th those are the ones who will work in commissioning groups as well as other organisations, and it doesn't have to be NHS structure as well. But bear in mind, we may also represent doctors that don't necessarily work exclusively in the NHS too. So it's, it's about all of the doctors. And I think it, it essentially comes down to our role as a trade union. Uh, we can only speak on behalf of what we recognize to speak on behalf of, which are trade union uh, doctors. And it's right that the, in, any, um, in any contract, there has to be at least one GP. Is that right? A little bit more convoluted than that in terms of it depends on what contract it is. For, for the GMS, PMS and APMS ones, the, the rules around that are slightly different. Um, I am actually rewriting the guidance on that one, so which will hopefully be able to uh, be published relatively soon about who can and who can't be a contract holder in different uh, different types uh, of GP contracts. And again, there's a subtle difference between them in uh, England and outside of England as well, in the three world nations, which we need to look at that too. I guess I was just wondering if there could ever be a situation where there's a contract that doesn't have a GP amongst it, and then who does that negotiation on behalf of them? Yeah, I mean, again, to be clear about the contract negotiations, the APMS contract element of it, we, we don't negotiate because APMS is a local contract. Yeah. We are a national organization, so we, we negotiate on the GMS contract, which is replicated across PMS, but there's no obligation for that to be replicated across APMS contracts. But where the clauses are the same, it, it is replicated uh, on that behalf, But which is why I, I keep going on about the strength of the GMS contract as a national GP contract and the value it brings and the stability and the continuity it brings to the profession as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Nicola, was there any more questions? Oh, um, someone's having no, a fire there, alarm. No, there... Is that yours, there Krishna? Yeah, I'm going to have to leave. Okay. So okay, no no problem at all. Get, no. get yourself no. safe. Oh, no, that's finished. It may be a test. Oh, that's done. <laughs> That stop. You could have planned that. <laughs> Go on, okay. back to you, Nicola. So no, no other questions really within the chat um, for Krishna. Just some conversation around how we, as practice managers, move really towards getting that recognition and, and availability to become mm -hmm. managing partners, um, whether we look at union membership, that sort of thing. OK, brilliant. So, um, anything else you want to kind of add, Krishna? Uh, I'm first to, to say thank you. I know I've said that to the four of you before. Uh, it, it's been a, a very challenging 18 months. Uh, and thanks for all, uh, all that you do all over the country. And thanks to the Institute for working with us uh, in recent times. And, and we've been able to really forge a very positive relationship. And I sincerely hope that that continues a very, very long time into the future. It's been fantastic working with you. And wholeheartedly appreciate all the efforts, all the facts managers do everywhere. Oh, don't make me all emotional. I'm a bit on the edge oh, today. Oh, bless you. No, no, I don't want to push you. <laughs> no. no. Oh, and your alarm's going again, yeah, is it? I'm, I'm going to let you go. Uh, Take care, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to watch the flames come around his ears, do I? Okay. 
thank you all so much. I think that was a really, really positive conversation. Um, I'm going to ask um, Jill to stop the recording now.